Conditions made subsets, ran the ANOVA. All right, we don't have to check the assumptions because we always, we already did it as like the omnibus check of all of our data. All right, if, if all of our assumptions are met, then all of the assumptions remain met as we take, start taking subsets to do post hoc tests. So these two are similar, these two are similar, and then as we progress to medium high, each of our lines, each of our data points are different from each other. Then we ask you to do. Same thing with light, so taking subsets for each of the different light levels and look to see if nutrients had an effect. What we're looking at basically is this trend here. So like on the blue line, that's our 100% light. Is there a difference between low nutrient, medium nutrient, and high nutrient? Yes, yes or no. And if there is a difference, which ones are different? We're going to do the same thing for the green line and for the red line and the black line. So that's where we left off yesterday. Hopefully you were able to do it. Did everyone figure it out? All right, so this is kind of the summary. So at the low light level, that was at the very top line, nutrient has a significant effect. I obtained an ANOVA F statistic 116, uh, 0.71 with a p-value less than 0 0.001. When I did a two-piece post hoc on that, on that, I had all heights differed across all levels. So the low height, low nutrient height was different from the medium nutrient height, which was different from the high nutrient height. And in fact, it was highest nutrient had the highest plants, lowest nutrients had the lowest plants. At the medium light, same pattern, same pattern. At the medium high light, nutrient had significant effect. All right. Plants were tallest and similar at the medium and high nutrient. So in this case, at the high and the medium nutrient levels, there's no difference in the height, but each of those was different from the low nutrient condition. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll look at the graph again. And at the high light, 100%, nutrient had a significant effect. The only difference that was observed is between the low and the high nutrient levels. So kind of moving forward in this graph, for the black line, that was 25% light. Each of our points was different. Each of our points was different for the red, red line. For the blue line, these two points were the same. This point was different. And then for the blue line, I should be doing it over here. For the blue line, medium is not different from either of these, but the high is larger than the low. So kind of our two extremes. All right, so we kind of, we had the interaction, we had to go through all this trouble to try to figure out and explain where our differences fall. Now the fun part. This is the write up. Yeah. Right? It's massive. All right, so kind of walk through and say the effects of light and nutrient on plant height was investigated, assumptions of ANOVA were assessed using quantile quantile plots in the Brown Foresight test. All right? And that's typically sufficient, including brown force to get the F statistic degrees freedom p value, right? So two A and over revealed significant interaction effect. No, I didn't talk about main effects. We've got an interaction effect, so now we're going to have to start taking subsets. All right. So same thing. F statistic degrees freedom p value, and I interpret it. So it suggests that the effect of light depends on the nutrient level in which the plant is grown, and vice versa. To further investigate the interaction effect, subsets of data were analyzed to control for each of the variables. All right, remember, when we take a subset, we're controlling for that variable at hand. All right, so when grown with medium or high nutrient conditions, decreasing light produced significantly taller plants. So medium or high nutrients, 
right? We have progressively different plants. We had differences for each of these. When grown in the low nutrient conditions, light still affected plant height, but plants grown with 75 and 100% light, light levels are similarly sized and shorter than plants grown in 25%, 50% light. No difference in height was, was observed in plants grown with 25 and 50% light. Under 25%, so there's our ANOVA, and 50% light, plant heights increased with increasing nutrient levels. So here's our black and our yellow line that we're talking about. Significant effects of nutrients were also observed with 75% and 100% lights. For the 75% light, light treatment, plants grown with low nutrients were shorter the plants grown in medium or high nutrients, and no difference in height was observed between the medium and high nutrient. In the 100% light treatment, a low nutrient plants were shorter than high nutrient plants, but medium nutrient plants exhibited similar height to all nutrient conditions. So in general, then, taller plants were observed as light levels decreased and as nutrient levels increased. So we kind of went through with the results. You really do have to explain where our differences fall. And then kind of like the, the big, you know, final reveal is this last point right down here, which is really just the, the gem of it, which is, yeah, just in general, based on what we're finding. Lower light levels produce taller plants, more nutrients produce taller plants. All right? So you can see, it's, it, it, the more of these things you have, the larger your results section will get. All right. If you don't have interactions, then your results section is going to be really small. With interactions, it increases. Any questions? No? All right, so I've got homework three posted. Right. Homework three is all about 2A ANOVA. It's about Simplification and, and interpretation. And I just to kind of give you a preview. This is, I mean, all, all of your assumptions should be met. Or at least they should be met to the point where you can just run classical tests because that's basically all that we've, we've covered. All right? I do want you to check them. You just, you always have to get in the, in the, uh, get in the process of checking these things. All right? And as you're doing this, you get practice making subsets. So what you're going to do with this homework is find the simplest model, analyze the effects, and then for each of the questions, you're going to write up the results and include a figure. You can use interaction plots, you know, if you have like a significant interaction. So in this case, we did have a significant interaction. If you don't have a significant interaction, oftentimes you can get by with just two different box plots. Uh, could we use like subscripts or small letters on the graph to kind of show which are different? Maybe, maybe, all right? The graph would start to become very confusing if you start having like letters and different numbers to indicate significant differences. Right? I think this is sufficient to really kind of give the results and then in the text, you have to, you would have to explain it. But uh, this will take some time. So I put, I set a due date for Monday. It gives you time to practice the rest of the week and on the weekend. And then I put the time as like 7 o'clock. So if you run into problems or you have questions on Monday, we could ask them at the beginning of class. All right? And then we can fix it. And you still have time to kind of fix it and get it uploaded. Any questions?
addressed situations when we've Radishes, I think. Radishes. All right. And we're also going to use one that is built in. That should be posted. All right, so we didn't talk about what happens when we violate assumptions. I kind of think it's going to be easier to address that as we start getting building bigger and bigger models. Because the process remains the same. And actually, it becomes a little bit easier uh, as we start to get bigger and bigger models. So with our more complex ANOVAs, what we're talking about is that we have three or more factor level independent variables. And with those variables, with that slew of variables, we're interested in if any of them or all of them influence or affect our measurement variables. So we still have these categorical variables that they're the classifications, and then you have something that you measure. All right? Our approach is going to be the same, but it's just a little bit more complicated because we've got a lot more variables. Our assumptions remain the same. Data are arraignment independent, normality within each combination, equal variance across the com combination of loads. All right, checking the assumptions, somewhat easy uh, for the brown foresight test because it handles all of those uh, combinations. A little bit harder for the normality because we have to figure out all possible combinations. All right, model simplification, also going to be pretty, pretty much the same. We can use classical tests. All right, look at that ANOVA tables. Uh, or we can use AIC or randomization tests. And I'm going to kind of allude to it now that AICs will likely be our second choice. It'll come up with the exact same conclusions, exact same simplest model if all of our assumptions are, are met. And it'll also come up, if our assumptions are violated, it'll come up with the same conclusions as a randomization test. All right, I do say with the randomization test, you probably want to avoid those because of issues with choosing a permutation method. And the reason the issues come up is how do we handle significant interactions? How do we handle the, the, the interaction terms that are in the model? With the two-way, we just shuffle everything, and that accounts for, that accounts for the two ways. But what happens if we've got two-way two and three-way ANOVAs, or two-way uh, and three-way interactions in the model, how do we go about doing some of that? How do we go about doing some of those permutations? I will show you how to do what's called a restricted permutational ANOVA, which is good if we have, let's say, a simple 
two-way ANOVA with, uh, or a three-way ANOVA, and we need to control for one of the variables. But for the most part, whenever you do model simplification, AIC, using information criterion, is going to be going to be the best way to handle it. Post hoc tests are another story. All right, because once we start getting multi-way interaction levels, then things start to become really interesting. Let's say, just, you know, with our light nutrient levels, that example, we had significant interaction. It was very easy for us to take subsets of light and look, look at the nutrients. Very easy for us to take subsets of nutrients to investigate the effect of light. If we added a third, so if we had light, nutrients, and then we had, let's say, Strain. What are they? What's it called? Uh, cultivar. Cultivar. Let's say cultivar. We have that third, and we've got a three-way interaction. We take a subset of light, and we we start then instead of with a simple ANOVA, we start with a two-way ANOVA, and first look at that interaction of that, and have to simplify from there. All right. Nice thing though is. If once we checked our assumption of the big model, all of those assumptions, if they're met, follow through to everything else. But you can start saying, we're going to have a subset of light. And if the interaction term, if that two-way interaction term is significant in the two-way ANOVA, now you're going to do a subset of that. So you have a subset of light. Now you're at a subset of a subset to continue the interaction. It becomes very, very complicated, very tricky, very quickly. But we will work through some of them. Maybe. Maybe. All right. So with the three-way ANOVA, all right, we've got our same assumptions. All right, data are random and independent. We're going to talk about making that assumption uh, for this class. The normality, I've already said, we have to address every, each combination of all possible levels. But this can quickly become tedious. Just think about how many QQ plots we've made with that light nutrient combination. Now if we add cultivar, it's that number for every cultivar type that we had. So if we had five cultivars, we had, I don't remember how many QQ plots. I didn't open them all. Right. Was it 12? 12? Yeah, so if you had five cultivars, it's 12 for each of those. Now you're looking at 60 QQ plots. Tedious, right? Actually, it might be a good example. Time consumer, right? Homocytosticity, easy to do. Levine test handles it properly. Fligner, Fligner test, we have to do our trick and make that new variable using the pace, pace function to create, to create that, new, uh, that new one. So you can see it's going to be a little bit tricky. But there is an alternative for it, all right? There's, there's two different things that we could do. One is a graphical check. And the graphical check utilizes the residuals of our model. What are the residuals? What are the residuals? What are residuals of a model? What's that? Okay. Not my answer. What does that mean? How much our regression line misses our data point? In a simple one-way 
model, right? You've got your x, you have your y, you've got your series of points. And then your regression fits a line to minimize the residuals. The residuals is the distance of each of these points to our line. Right, so the least squares method is trying to minimize the square of our deviance. That's our least squares method. We're trying to make it as, as good as we can. So our line is going to be shifting up and down. It's going to be rotating until we find to that. The residual is this, is this value, right? is that distance. We're going to look at those residuals for our model. All right? We're going to look at the residuals of those models, and it's going to generate a series of four plots. And we can utilize those plots to see how well our assumptions are met. Now, it's pretty easy to do, and it's pretty reliable. All right? Let me, uh, let me fix this real quick. We typically create our linear model and we call it something. We call it mod or model one or mod full. I do mod full. All right? Then it's sim simply saying plot of our model. And R is going to give us a series of four plots. Right? Now, with our plots, with our assumptions, or with our residuals, if all of our assumptions are met, our residuals should be random. They should be normally distributed. And we can assess that using these plots. So it's easy to do. It's also reliable. The problem is that there's no p-values. So somebody might complain, hey, you don't have p-values to show me that, it's, that it, the assumptions are met. Also, it's somewhat arbitrary. It, it, it's somewhat arbitrary because you're looking at a plot and you're saying, yeah, that looks like it's pretty good. Right. I'm going to say that's OK. I think most people say it's OK because ANOVA this method is pretty robust to our violations, with the exception of our unequal variances. The alternate method is to run a statistical test that kind of looks at the composite of all of these assumptions. All right, so this is kind of like an omnibus test that looks at all of our assumptions all at once and generates a, a p-value. Now, what this does is actually looks at the residuals of that full model. So here we are again, utilizing the residuals the distance differences between our prediction and the actual data point. The package that we're going to use to do this test is the GVLMA pack package. GVLMA. So if you're on a personal computer, you're going to have to download it and install it. If you're in on the computers here, it should already be installed. All right. This GVLMA is Global Validation of Linear Model Assumptions. That's what it's a, a, an abbreviation for, or an acronym. All right, pros, it also pretty easy to do, and it generates a p-value. Cons, you could easily misinterpret the output if we ignore the variable types in our model. All right, so kind of runs into issues when we have a lot of if we have mixed model or mixed variable types, so categorical and continuous variables, could run into problems. We'll talk about these. So we're going to start with GBLMA. I'm going to show you how, how this is done. All right, so GBLMA is an omnibus test that checks for normality, homoscedasticity, and linearity. What is the linearity? This. Can we get a straight line attached to our to our data? Or with this, I'm gonna get it. Make sure it's zoomed in a little bit. All right, linearity is checking this. Right, do we have a straight line or?
is our data looking something like that, where it's curved? And that's also an important assumption. So with our least squares method, uh, it's going to assume, it's gonna, our full model is going to check if we're linear or not. All right? And if it violates that, that assumption, then we're probably going to have to look at some uh, curvature of terms. So squares, maybe cubes, some sort of polynomial. All right? So our package, the actual function is GVLMA, and it's in our package. All right? And we can access it by giving it a formula along with our data. Or we can create our linear model first and then pass that to the global, to the GVLMA function. I think this method, creating the full model and then passing it to GVLMA is, is preferred. That's, this is typically what I do. All right. When you do this, you hit enter and you run it, it's going to give you some output. And we're going to see this. What we look at is the very top line, which is the global stat line. This is the one that we look at. You don't look at anything else. We look at this line. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, then our assumptions are met. We're good to go to proceed with our ANOVA. If a p-value is less than 0.05, then at least one of our assumptions was violated. In this case, we can then look at the remaining lines to kind of get an idea as which, which assumption was actually violated. All right. So, if it's greater than 0.05, if the global stat line is greater than 0.05, we're good. If the global stat line is less than 0.05, we're not. All right. And I'm good. I can't stress this enough. You look at the global stat line because there will be times where this value is greater than 0.05, but then in lines underneath it, you'll get significant p-values, and you'll be tempted. Well, it violated homoelasticity. No, it didn't. If this is greater than 0.05, you do not violate homoelasticity. This is our omnibus test. You can think of it as this. This is the omnibus test. This is the ANOVA. All of the lines underneath it are like the two keys post hoc. All right? So if you run this, I don't think this will happen here in class, but it's possible if you run this on your own data. You might receive an error that says system is computationally singular. All right. The check summary mod for NA, that's error. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is look at the summary of the model. And what you should see is that one of the coefficients is, is NA. And what this is telling us is that we don't have all of the possible combination of data types. So we've got, let's say, five cultivars, the four light treatments, the three nutrient treatments. And let's say something happened to you, you know, the 50% light for cultivar one and, and medium nutrient, and you lost all of those plants. This would fail because you don't have any data for that combination. So there's kind of have to work around with that. I give it put it up here because you might encounter it. Not in this class, but maybe in the future. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to work with the cabbages package again. All right? We've already worked with cabbages, or the cabbages data set. All right? This was in the mass package. This is the vitamin C levels in the head of cabbage and stuff. We've already checked it. We've already checked our assumptions. All right? But we're going to use that package for us just to confirm using this GVLMA so we can see the examples. So go ahead and load the cabbages package. Again, a couple different ways to do that. You can load, you can actually load the mass package and then cabbages will be accessible. Or if you didn't want to load the mass package, you can do something like this, right at the top where you use data, cabbages, package equals mass. And that tells R, okay, access the cabbages package, get that in memory, and you can find that in the mass package, the data set. Get the cabbages data set in mem memory package is mass. All right, so once you do this, we know what we're interested in. We want to know if cultivar and planting date has an effect on vitamin C levels. All right, we know we want to run an ANOVA. So what we do is create our linear model first, create our full model. Vitamin C is a function of cultivar plus, or times date. 
I call that mod one. And then to run our GVLMA, our global validation of linear model assumptions, we just do GVLMA mod one. When you run it, you should get this output. Go ahead, run it, make sure you get this output. Did it work? It should. It was plant growth, right? That was our data set? Really? Yeah, plant growth. I'm going to load plant growth in. Do that. Load plant growth. Check your GVLMA. We've already checked our assumptions, right? We know what we should get. Uh, don't forget, make sure you get the factors correct. Here on our CAVGIS data set, all right, it gives this output. It tells us what the model was. Right? Vitamin, we're, we're checking the model. Vitamin C is a function of cultivar times date. It has estimates of our coefficients. Right? This would be like from the summary of our full model. All right? And then it checks this. And it sets a level of significance at 0.05. I think that's sufficient. If you ever need to go more, just to be a string, more stringent on it, we could always set that. But it, we're just going to leave it as the default. And then it runs this. Oops. All right. Our interest is in this very top line, the global stat. All right. The global stat line is this. That's what we look at. The p-value is 0.5658. That is greater than 0.05, it tells me all of our assumptions are met. So what were the assumptions that it's checking? It's checking normality. Is our data normally distributed within each group? How does it check it? It assesses skewness of our data and kurtosis of our data. All right, so what's skewness? Yeah, tailed. All right, are we heavy in one tail or the other? What's kurtosis? Yeah, peaked or shouldered, right? Both of those affect our, our normality assumption. It checks heterosynasticity, right? What, what is that term? Uh, yeah, unequal variances, right? All right, and the other one is the link function. That link function is tied to our, our linearity, all right? So if we, ha if we try to do this with, let's say, a logistic regression, all right, hopefully it fails because if we have the wrong link function tied to that, all right? So what about plant growth? Here's mine. All right, I ran plant growth, made my full model. Did GVLMA of mod full, global stat line, 0.959. All our assumptions are met, we stop there. We also had biomass in this model. Run it, let's check biomass. So instead of predicting height, let's see if biomass differs between the light and the nutrients. Move this off.
here's mine. I just copy and paste it. A few jumps and just change it to biomass. Change height to biomass. All right, run it. Global sat line, that's what matters. I get a p-value of 1.8 times 10 to the negative 4. GVLMA is also nice because it actually gives us the decision. It says assumptions not satisfied. All right, so we violated the assumptions of ANOVA with, with, when we looked at biomass. Which assumption was violated? Well, based on the next lines, it looks like it's probably normality, probably skewed. All right. So we can kind of then assess that to say, well, if we're skewed, perhaps we can continue with ANOVA. Maybe we need to look at it a little bit more closely to make sure that everything's skewed in the correct direction. Or uh, maybe we just say, heck with it, let's do a non, uh, let's, let's not do our classical test. All right, so that was our own plant growth data set. I have another one. So in the car package, there's a data set called salaries, where it looked at salary of individuals based on the rank, discipline, and sex. This is the salary of faculty members based on the discipline that they're in, sex of the faculty member, and the rank of the faculty member. All right? So in this one, I made a full model to see does rank, sex, and discipline affect our salary, faculty salaries. And we get this. So it's in the car package. You've probably already loaded the car package uh, to do the QQ plots. We don't have to do anything tricky with that. So if you run this, this is what I get. And again, just reemphasize this the global stat line is the only line that matters. There might be times where I intentionally mess up these numbers just to throw you off, just to get you to the point that we're looking at global stat line. That's the line that matters. That's what we look at. Which I, I, I did try to do that. I spent a lot of time creating new data sets, and then after about 15 or 20 minutes, I said, heck with this. Copy and pasted it, and then just edited the text. <laughs> would have been wrong. I think I had someone call me out on it. I didn't I did GVLMA and I didn't get the same numbers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So pretty easy, right? Pretty easy to do. All right. But again, there may be a time where you're working with data where it says you can't do it. It can't do it because it has a ziggy layer. So let's check out the graphical methods. All right. Basis is that we fit our data to a model. All right. and, and the model that we get is basically an equation. The deviations from those lines uh, and the actual data points are the residuals. And what we're going to do is use the residuals and plot them in a couple different ways. All right. If all of our assumptions are met, then the residuals should be random. When we just look at a scatter plot of all our residuals, it should look like a scatter plot, completely random. There should be no pattern in our data. If we standardize our residuals to like their, their mean, then they should all be, then it should be normally distributed. So we can look at that. We can look, let's say, a QQ plot of our residuals. All right. So if we end up running into errors with the GBLMA, our fallback is going to be the plot of our full model. All right. So we already made the full model for the cabbages data set, right? So go ahead, do plot of your mod.full, or plot of mod, I think I called it mod in this. Yeah, I called it mod 1. Go ahead and do plot mod 1. And when you run it, you should see that we get four plots. All right. So in these four plots, I'm going to go through and tell you what each one, each one is going to do. And 
this was written as, as if we weren't using our markdown. So our markdown would give you the four plots that you just kind of click on. So the first plot is a plot of the residuals versus the fitted value. All right, so the, resi the fitted value is the X and then the residuals. That pattern that we see should be completely random. It should look like a, a scatter, it should look like a shotgun blast. All right. Violations of this will reveal, uh, it should appear as some sort of nonlinearity if we have a continuous independent variable. And it should, and, and it'll also reveal heterostaticity. So if we see something like, instead of a shotgun blast, if you see something like a hump shaped or like a U shaped pattern in your graph, that typically indicates that we have some sort of nonlinearity going on. If we look at it and we get somewhat of a trumpet blast, where the points on one side of the graph are really close to, to uh, are really close together, and then the points at the opposite extreme are really far apart, it typically indicates heterostaticity. Plot number two is a normal quantile quantile plot, and we've been working with this. And again, if we're normally distributed, all of our points should fall on a straight line. So our interpretation of that is, is standard. Plot three is the scale versus location. This plot is going to look at heterostaticity. What it does is it plots a uh, best fit line at the square root of the standardized residuals. All right. That line, that resulting point, that line should be horizontal. All right. If we have unequal variances, then what we see is that our variances increase. If we ranked our variances in order, Right, from smallest to largest, they should be pretty much the same. But if we have unequal variances, then it should be a small variance, and then it progressively gets larger. And that means our best fit line will then be a sloped, sloped line. And we'll look at some of these. And then our final plot, plot four, is a residuals versus leverage plot. All right? Leverage is, is this idea that our data points are influencing our overall equation. All right, a data point with high amount of leverage will have one value, will we'll produce, let's say, one set of equations and coefficients when it's included in the model, and then when we remove the model, all of a sudden things change. So let's say we did our plant growth data set, and we've got our light and nutrients. If we have a data point with a large amount of leverage, Maybe that point gives us significant interaction effect. But if we remove the point from the data, data set, then the interaction is not significant. All right, Our data, our analysis, shouldn't be dependent on a single data point making it significant. That's this concept of leverage. So we can look at our residuals as this idea of leverage. And all of our residuals should have about a similar amount of leverage. So if we remove one, it's not going to change any of our interpretation. For us, we're going to look at, at points, only those points that have a label attached to them. If they have a label attached to them, those are the points that we probably need to look at a little bit more. These points tend to be outliers, tend to be outliers, and they're going to influence our model fit, and thus the predictive equations. Did, Blake, did you have an outlier in your data set? At one point, right? Yeah, you had one. And what was it? It was a one fish that was like overly big or something like that, right? I said a typo. Yeah. Yeah, it was a typo. Yeah, it's it's in a real life situation, it's possible that you could get get one of these things. Uh, I mean, uh, Matt could be weighing his skunks, and he could have weighed a skunk after he feasted in the bin of McDonald's, all right? <laughs> all right, it, causing undue leverage in, in the model. I mean, it could happen, but typically if you see this, go back and look at your data, look at your, your hard copy versus the data sheet. Oftentimes it's a typo or some mistake in, in writing down the data, all right? So here's a plot one, residuals versus fit. This is what we're looking at. If we've got scattered here, we're good. There's really no obvious pattern. If we have a what's called like a trumpet-shaped pattern, 
That indicates heteroscedasticity. If we have like a curved pattern like this, hump shaped, we're nonlinear. We're nonlinear. Now, with categorical variables, things are going to look a little bit different. This is for continuous uh, predictor variables. Plot twos are standard QQ plots. All right, no change. If we really wanted to add these confidence intervals, we can. We can extract the residuals from our model to do a QQ plot, and I can show you how to, how to do that. Scale location looks like this. Now, this looks good. All right, this looks good. This does not. And what I want you to pay attention to is the scale of that y-axis. I know I said the line should be horizontal, and you can say, hey, Dr. N, this doesn't look horizontal to me. Well, look at our range. It goes from about 0.55, maybe 0.56, maybe to 1, not even to 1. All right, that's not really a huge change. Whereas this one goes from 0 0.2, 0 0.2, yeah, about 0.2, to over one, we have drastic change. So my general rule of thumb is, is if we stay within this point, 0 0.5, we're probably good. If it's more than 0 0.5, we might not be. But again, this looks at heteroscedasticity. So it's not just this graph. We also should see it in this graph, in numbers one and three, in graphs one and three. Unequal variance would manifest itself. And then our leverage plots are these last ones. All right. You can see some points are labeled. These are labeled. All right. This is, I'm not worried about it. Because on this plot, they also plot something called Cook's distance, which is a measure of, of an outlier, a measure of leverage. All right. We want our points to be, the assumption is, more than one Cook distance unit away. And this one is way out there. So when you look at a plot with the data set, you might not see this dashed line. If you don't see the dashed line, your data are good. They all have about the same leverage or similar amount of leverage. If you see the dashed lines on your plot and you've got points outside of those, those are the ones that you need to pay attention to. All right, so go ahead. Review the residual plots for our cabbages model and for our salaries model. We've already created the models. Go ahead, generate those plots. We know one of them, the assumptions are met. We know one of them, the assumptions are not met. And while you're at it, you can also look at the plots of our plant growth models, both the height and the biomass. Because again, we know one of them, the assumptions were met. We know the other one, the assumptions were not met.
get it? Let's talk about these. This is cabbages. Notice the difference. All right, with continuous variable, continuous x variable, yours is going to be scattered all over. But with categorical variables, we're going to have clearly defined groups. That's not a pattern. That's just a consequence of our data set. So when we have these groups, when we have categorical variables, what we're looking at is about random distances among all our groups. So this is looking pretty good. Pretty random. All of our points are pretty random. We don't have a bunch of points you know, high points up here, a bunch of low points down here, and a bunch of high points up here. We don't have that. We don't have points really close to our zero point here, and then all of a sudden it gets super large as we go down the line. All right, this looks pretty good. We look at our QQ plots, pretty good. We look at our scale location. Look, I mean, yeah, it looks, you could say it's maybe curved, but again, this is like point. 0 0.65, 0 0.7, that might be 0 0.8, that might be 0 0.65, 0 0.7. I mean, it's pretty much level. And we don't have any like trumpet shape going. Uh, and then our leverage, yeah, it looks pretty good. I don't see that Cook's distance listed on here. We look pretty good. All right, so did you get this? Mod 2. Okay, this one. This is salaries. You can see our pattern, right? It's we got a bunch of points real close to the line down here, and then they kind of spread out really, really far here. All right, I've got some issues. Our QQ plot. Look at that curvature. Scale location. <laughs> we're below 0 0.05 or 0.5 here, and we're almost up to one. All right, so we've got some, what looks like non-normality, possibly some heteroscedasticity, but this heteroscedasticity may be linked to that non-normality. Our leverage, there's a good distance line, so at least for this one, we don't really see any sort of uh, outliers. Now, I said we could do QQ plots ourselves, and we could. So, if you do names of your model, you're going to see everything that you can reference using the dollar sign. And in this level, we have residuals. So if I wanted to make a QQ plot using the car package, I can do QQ plot mod 2 dollar sign residuals to look at it more closely. And you can see now we have our, our dashed lines. Uh, do I ever do this? Not really. Just in case. What about plant growth? Did you guys see those? Move up here. So here's our height. All right, again, should be random. No pattern. Looks pretty good to me. QQ plot, looks pretty good. Scale location, again, looks pretty hair horizontal to me. And our outliers, again, we don't even see cook distance on, on, the, on there. What about biomass? Here's our residuals versus fitted. Doesn't look too bad, looks pretty good. QQ plot, ooh, ouch. This is curved. So remember, plots one and three indicate heteroscedasticity. Plot one could also reveal non-normality. Right? Plot one looks good. Plot two is our normality. Clear normality. Looks curved. All right. I'm, I'd basically say we're violating normality here. Our scale location, again, looks pretty good. We're, we don't see any increases. And then our, our outliers, nothing looks out of the ordinary. So 
pretty good. So for practice, we've already done it. Let's do warp brakes. Warp brakes is in the car package. I believe it's in the car package. So uh, what we're interested in is, is with this data set is they looked at looms, okay. breakage on looms. And they had different wool types, and then you also had different tensions that were applied to the loom. What we want to know does does wool type and tension affect the number of breaks that we see on a loom? Right, that's the data set, uh, the warp breaks data set. So that's our question. Use GVLMA to test the assumptions of ANOVA and then utilize the plots, the graphical methods, to confirm what GVLMA tells you. So did you get them? Did you look at the figures too? The plots? Not with how we do this. Yeah. But yeah, no, GBL and <laughs> Not for checking ours. Oh, no, I'm just saying that. All right. You guys good? <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me where.
<laughs> All right, so here's GBLMA. All right, remember, the line that matters is this global stat. That's what we look at. Right, so assumptions are not satisfied. Our p-value is 0.0449. It's close. No cigar. You can't probably say that, right? That'll be the new one. Close but no pay. All right, we're close. Now, which assumption was violated? Now we can kind of go down and, and say, okay, well, it might have been this heterosidasticity assumption. All right, it might have been this heterosidasticity function. But remember, this is close. So it's possible that if our data was modified just a little bit, we would still get, change this p-value from 0 0.002 to let's say 0 0.008, all right? It's less significant. That may be enough to bump this above 0 0.05. So that's why I said this is the line that matters. Look here first, all right? If this is not significant, you're good. Stop there, continue on with it. Because what it's doing is, is doing an omnibus test. It's accounting for everything all at once. What about the plots? I put all four plots here together uh, to make it easier to look at. All right, so our, uh, oops. Little bit. So residuals versus fitted. Oh, ooh, that that looks a little strange. All right. And I'm saying that we're really, you know, we're lower here. This one's really far. It does kind of look like we've got the trumpet shape. QQ plots look good, but then also scale location. Definitely, we're over that 0.5 threshold. All right. So and in our outliers, it doesn't look like we have any. So for the warp breaks data set, it looks like we are violating our assumptions, and that assumption that we violated is the equal variance. All right. Both GBLMA and our residual our residual plots suggest that. So our assumption check, just a review. GVLMA is an omnibus check. It checks for normality, homocytasticity, linearity of our, of, our, of our model. All right? Again, when we run this, we look at that global stat line. That's what we look at. What's that? And that global stat line, the reason one of the, these things we do that is we control for a type 1 error. So if we did our tests individually, we're doing multiple tests on our data set, it's going to be more likely that we find a violation, like what, we, like what I just told you, where you can... You have a significant p-value, but, but the global stat is, is not significant. All right, so that's why we look at the global stat line. If the p is greater than 0.05, our assumptions are met. If it's less than 0.05, then we violated at least one of the assumptions. Benefit of this, easy to do. Disadvantage, may detect slight violations, may give you assumption not met, but perhaps we can ignore that assumption, especially if it's just normality. Usually ANOVA and these linear models are pretty good for this. The other thing is that it only works for a linear model. What does that mean? If you do something like a Poisson regression, so doing survivor ship analysis, or you're doing, let's say, logistic regression, you can't really use this to check your assumptions. This is only good when you use LM on it. All right, LM of our model, linear model. Plots of the residual. Based on the fact that if our assumptions are met, then our residuals will be random and they will be normally distributed. Benefit of this, again, easy to create and work with most. Uh, they're easy to create and they do work with most, perhaps all of the different model types. So the generalized linear models, our mixed effects models, our, our uh, possibly our generalized additive, what is here? Gen what are those? Generalized models. Gam, do we juice? All right, so pretty easy to do. R doesn't. Disadvantages, no p value. Again, somebody can, can really say, hey, I need a p value, and then this isn't good. Second thing, it is an arbitrary decision. You have to look at the graph and just kind of make that assess. 
assessment. And the other thing is try to explain it in a paper, how you check your assumptions. You can say, I use the, you know, the uh, graphs of the residuals to check the assumptions. It's very difficult to verbalize it. Now what you could do is reference some textbooks, some of the art textbooks, talk about doing this. Use that as a reference. But again, somebody may say that I need you to explain more clearly how you did that. Again, you have to appease the reviewers in some cases. Other times, I would probably just respond, hey, I'm not going to do that because it adds to the paper and the, the, these citations. Maybe, if anything, I add a couple more citations that did the exact same thing. Or that perhaps find a paper that explained it and then say, this is what I did. This paper explains why it worked. All right. All right. What we're going to do is stop here because we're going to work with this radishes data set and we're going to kind of step through the checks of the assumptions and then we're going to uh, kind of do all of our, our analysis. All right? Yeah, it's 612 right now. We're going to stop here. We don't have time to, to work through it. So don't forget, we've got this homework. This homework, again, just kind of give you more practice doing simplification, doing those subsets, really doing the post hoc test. It will be tedious. Yes, it is. Right. But it's not like every question is going to have a significant interaction. Oh. Yep. Okay. Do it. 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 Explain why these don't have to go. Oh, okay. <laughs>